All right, everyone, buckle up and here we go. 140 years of quantum physics. Let's review the photoelectric effect from our master list of phenomena that have to do with absorption and emission between photons and electrons. The photoelectric effect is when you shine light onto a surface, usually a metal or a metalloid, selenium is particularly good at this, and the light acts as a carrier of energy. Basically, photons go in, electrons come out. Now, the main issue here is the binding energy of the metal. If the incoming energy is less than the binding energy, then the electrons stay in. You haven't paid your dues enough to break any of them ha out. Nothing happens. If the light energy equals the binding energy, then the electrons can break free. Can't really go anywhere or do anything, but at least they're free. Ah, if the light energy is greater than the binding energy, then the electrons can break free and they'll still have some extra energy left over to use as kinetic energy to get them out of there. And we know that moving electrons is what we called electricity when we first discover it. Big picture, you shine a light on this metal in this photoelectric cell and you will get a current in the metal. The photoelectric effect was known about for decades before Einstein started playing around with it. He didn't discover the photoelectric effect any more than James Watt discovered the steam engine. But Einstein's brilliance was to use the photoelectric effect as a measuring tool. Specifically, he wanted to measure the energy of a light wave. And he realized that if he measured the strength of the current and calculated the effective voltage difference that would allow you to calculate the energy of the light wave. The more energy de delivered by the light, the greater the kinetic energy of the electrons and the greater the current. This is huge. We ought to be getting a direct one-to-one -one correspondence here. Now, let's take a look at our models and what our graphs should look like. According to classical wave theory that we've been studying all semester, straight out of calculus, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. Then the energy of that light wave, one half k squared, and result of every calculus problem you can solve, and k here is two pi f by definition, straight out of your friend, the sine wave, and your friend, the cosine wave in algebra 2 trig, then take a look. We've got two variables here, frequency and amplitude. Amplitude for a light wave we always learned was brightness, so you ought to get a brighter light giving you a bigger current. Then increasing the frequency. We know that for visible light, frequency is color, warm colors, red, orange, and yellow have lower frequencies, and cool colors, blue, green, and violet, have higher frequencies. So as we go through the rainbow from warm to cool, the kinetic energy of the ejected electrons should increase and the current should increase. Hey, Einstein's got two hands, he can work two knobs. If he turns up the brightness a certain amount and turns down the frequency a certain amount, then eventually he should be able to get the two of uh, dials to compensate for each other. One increase should knock out the decrease. What's more, a graph of kinetic energy versus amplitude should be a nice parabolic shape, whereas a graph of energy versus frequency should be linear. Let's turn the clock back 20 years and see if there are any other equations that start with E equals that we ought to be familiar with just before we turn on the equipment. Let's go back to the work in thermodynamics done by Max Planck, or as they say with American accents, Max Planck. Planck was studying black body radiation. Radiation inside an almost completely closed cavity, that's why it's black, you can't see anything. The idea is that the photon gets in, but the photon can't come out. So it rattles around in the black body, bouncing off the sides. Black body radiation is a particle 
model. Planck was working with thermodynamics. It models particles bouncing around in an almost closed space, and given the energy of the particle, you can get a certain frequency on the walls of that space. Bam, 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 bam is low frequency. Bam, 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 bam is high frequency. That comes from a much greater energy. Planck found a one-to-one -one linear correspondence between the frequency of the vibration and the energy of the particles. H is here Planck's constant, 6.26 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. Now, Planck theory explains so much about radiation as we know it. Notice could be thermal radiation, but it could be electromagnetic radiation. Einstein makes the connection. Revving up the brightness should do nothing to the current if electromagnetic radiation works by the Planck model. Increasing the frequency should increase the kinetic energy and should increase the current, just as before, a linear relationship. However, Einstein shouldn't be able to play with the dials and have A, or the square root of A, compensate for F. A, the amplitude, should only be a factor in how many electrons get hit and break loose. In the classroom lab at this point, we were going to break out the full photoelectric system. We're going to have a mercury sodium vapor light source as per all of your documentation, so we will know the exact wavelength, which is, gives us the exact frequency in the exact color. We'll be taking data on five bands, yellow, green, both of which are very easily whited out by classroom light and we'll use filters. Blue, violet, and thanks to our fluorescent screen, we will see what looks like an extraviolet, but is really ultraviolet, all here with fluorescent screen for converting UV rays, uh, downgraded into visible violet light by exciting the electrons two levels and have them jump down, bonk, bonk, each of those lower energy photons being low enough that we can actually see it. Uh, mercury sodium lights also have a band in the orange too, but it's very weak. It's easily washed out by white light and it doesn't give good data. Check your lab sheets and your data sheets for correspondence with Einstein's results. Einstein found that red light does absolutely nothing, no matter how bright it is. And a very dim violet light does get a current running. It's a high current, even though it takes a long time for the system to finally register it. Einstein finds that increased intensity means more electrons, but it does not mean more kinetic energy. It does not mean a higher current. Fact, the energy of a light ray does not depend on the amplitude. It just doesn't. And this flies in the face of the basic definition of a wave as laid out by common trigonometry and held up by basic calculus. A wave, as we define a wave, has an energy that's directly proportional to the square of the amplitude. Visible light does not. Einstein received his Nobel Prize for proving that light is not a wave. Yes, yes, I know, it diffracts like a wave, it undergoes destructive and constructive interference like a wave, but it does not follow equals one-half Ka squared as all proper sine and cosine waves do. Einstein goes back to Newton and proves him light. Well, light is a corpuscle, it is a particle, not a wave. So, here's our new word of the century, photon. We'll use the lowercase Greek gamma for the photon. Yeah, yeah, I know, it looks like an ion. Just, just write a lowercase ion and you're good with it. Oh, by the way, if you're familiar with the cities of Sodom and Amora, or that coastal Mediterranean place called Aza, and you notice that translating through the Greek and Latin into English gives you Gomorra and Gaza instead of Amora and Aza, Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. The the ion and the gamma. Ah, okay, all right. Now, now we're, we're starting to get the other pieces of the puzzle. All right, here we are. One photon is one little particle of light. 
The photon follows the Planck model of a particle bouncing around in an almost closed black box with a certain frequency. This means that light is finite. You can model it like a hose of water. You can have a fire hose, foosh, lots and lots and lots of particles with a very high amplitude, or you can have a garden hose spray a few particles looking like a low amplitude. However, if it's a wave, you ought to be able to cut it in half indefinitely. There's no number so small that mathematics can't cut it in half. But if you're talking about a particle model, if these are unitary, then they have to be counted in integer numbers. And there has to be a level that you can turn the light down, and you can turn the light down, and you can turn the light down. And there comes a point where the light is either on or it's off. And that point is one photon. There's no such thing as half a photon if they're particles. Taylor in 1909 confirms this using a photosensitive screen. He looks at this kind of photoelectric effect photon by photon, and he confirms that there is a point in which the light is either on or off, and there is no such thing as dimmer, confirming Einstein's particle model. Incidentally, Taylor wasn't just looking for the on-off switch. Um, Taylor was looking at some of the other well-known properties of light. Specifically, he was looking at double-slit diffraction, the same kind of double-slit diffraction you modeled in your labs with the virtual ripple tank. You can see there's a light source here, um, three walls and two little gaps in the walls where the light can come through. And you know from our wave model of light that waves diffract around the corners. They spread. Each particle on the wave front is a source of new wave fronts spreading in circular patterns such that the local maximum is right here, smack in the middle of the wall, on the opposite side of the wall that nobody ought to be able to cross. That's where you have the most and the brightest of the light because we've got two waves undergoing constructive interference at that point, one spreading from this slit and one spreading from this slit. Taylor, of course, found the same pattern, and that makes sense if you've got particles of water spraying in all directions out of here and particles of water spraying in all directions out of here. Standing here, you might get wet. But as Taylor turned the light down and fewer and fewer and fewer photons came out, Taylor saw a skeleton of the same diffraction pattern he'd been seeing when the light was abundant, so abundant that we thought it was a wave. When he turned the light down to one photon, where did that one photon end up more often than anywhere else? Yes, right smack dab in the middle of the no-fly zone. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're telling me that half the photon diffracted through here and the other half diffracted through here, and the two halves of a photon underwent constructive interference and made one full photon here? That's insane! That's gibberish! That makes no sense at all! No, really, that makes no sense at all. And this is where we kiss goodbye to the word particle. Because if you try to do that with a meatball at dinner, and you cut the meatball in half with your knife, um, and you set up the tines of a fork, and you try to spread half a meatball through this side and half a meatball through that side in order to reassemble a whole meatball on the other side, you'll get spaghetti and meat sauce. You will probably get the honor of doing the dinner dishes and probably washing the tablecloth as well in the laundry, but you certainly will not get your meatball back. Let's come up with a new word that's not particle and that's not wave for something that can do this, and that word is quantum. Quantum was a word coined about 1900. Notice we're talking even before the photoelectric effect results were published. A quantum, which is sort of as a micro singular of the word quantity, that's where it comes from, means a little tiny particle of wave. In English, we tried the word wavicle, but it just didn't catch on outside of physics circles. A quantum is a small unitary, indivisible packet of energy. It's completely whole. You can't cut it in half. But because it's a little packet of wave, it has a distinct frequency, it has a defined wavelength, and yes, it follows the Planck model e equals hf, where the energy is directly proportional to the frequency and nothing else. 
quantum are microscopic particles. You don't get big ones. They simply don't work that way. If it's visible to the naked eye, if it's visible on the scale of a cell or a cell wall, that's not one quantum. That's lots and lots and lots and lots of their quanta. Planck coined the term. He used the idea of quanta to describe the quantities of radiation that he was studying. And this newly discovered light packet or photon of light certainly fits his bill. There it goes. Sometimes it's one place, sometimes it's another place. Now then, 1913, let's put all the pieces together. Nationalism is at world heights. Countries have been arming for decades in hopes of getting them out themselves onto the global scene of what will be called first world nations. The whole world is racing toward conflagration and Niels Bohr has a new model of the atom he's been working on for years and years and years. And all the other scientists are like, can I see it? Can I see it? Can I see it? Can I see it? And he says, it's not done. I keep telling you, it's not done. Finally, finally, with war on the horizon, they managed to drag him kicking and screaming to the publishing house in 1913, and we get the Bohr model of the atom, the one in corporate. Bohr's model is the one we all know and love from middle school, with a whole bunch of protons in the nucleus together, and electrons going around them in little orbits like planets at fixed distances from the nucleus. And Bohr explains the significance of each orbit is an energy level. We got energy level one, energy level two, energy level three, and in order to jump from one level to another, the electron must absorb a photon to jump up and emit a photon to jump down. This is the interaction that we were talking about earlier with fluorescence, where an electron absorbs an ultraviolet photon and jumps two levels, and then bonk, jumps down one level, and sometime later, bonk, jumps down another level, absorbing one photon and emitting two of lower energies. The Bohr model explains so much. It explains everything we've ever seen. It incorporates Rutherford's nucleus um, and Chadwick's electrons having graduated from the plum pudding model to more stable position. It explains incandescence that allowed Edison to invent that light bulb fluorescence, phosphorescence, which we now call glow in the dark and don't link uniquely to phosphorus, the photoelectric effect, everything. Absorb electrons, go up, emit electrons, go down. Take a look at the aurora borealis or the aurora australialis near the South Pole. Look at these beautiful greenish, bluish, sometimes pinkish rainbows in the sky. We don't get them around here and we don't get them around here because we don't have such a strong magnetic field as near the magnetic poles of the Earth. Charged particles coming from the sun, cosmic rays, spiral around in the strong magnetic fields near the poles. And when they're spiraling around like crazy, chances are sooner or later, bam, they're going to hit an electron in the atmosphere, exciting that electron to no end, and the electrons will de-excite themselves soon enough when they discover these upper levels aren't stable. The de-exciting electrons emit photons on their way down. For oxygen, the difference in these energy levels tends to be directly proportional to the frequency we associate with green. Nitrogen tends to be directly proportional to the frequency we associate with blue, so a little higher energy. Uh, or if it goes in two steps, boom, boom, the jump from here to here is red. It's a much lower energy. Um, red can mix with blue to make that sort of purple, and it is absolutely gorgeous. You can tell how good the Bohr model is by the fact that we're still using it now. The problem with the Bohr model, though, is that it didn't explain everything. Bohr was really, really aggravated to be forced to publish it before he was good and ready. He knew he wasn't ready because he couldn't answer these questions. So we in the late 20th and early 21st century can rake the Bohr model across the coals and call him an idiot for not having figured things out yet. He wasn't an idiot. He just wasn't done yet. Here's what Bohr wanted to know. Why are those distances fixed? He calculated very clearly that electrons were orbiting in certain locations and not others. What's so special about those locations? Why can't they be just anywhere they want? For that matter, the Bohr model describes electrons going around the nucleus like planets going around the sun. 
Why? Why circular? Especially when you go back to the 1500s and say, hey, Johannes Kepler pointed out even planets don't go around in circles, they go around in ellipses. What's so special about the circle? Why energy level one, energy level two, energy level three? Why not 1.25? Why not 9.81? Why are decimals suddenly forbidden here? Bohr's only clue and our only clue is this. Each drop from one level to the other seemed to admit one quantum of light, one quantum precisely, one photon with a certain energy. All right, 1914 comes around. The crowned head of Europe are at each other's throats. Nikki and Willie send the letter saying, "Ah, can't we just be friends? And within a week, their armies are slaughtering each other across Europe. Not good for scientific research. Everybody has to hunker down and survive from 1914 to 1918. Major centers uh, of learning sustain damage in the war. And it takes us a while, even after the war is over, um, to survive the Spanish influenza epidemic, a pandemic very similar to this one, and get the universities rebuilt. That's why we don't really make much progress on this until Louis de Broglie um, submits his doctoral dissertation at the University of Paris in 1926. Louis de Broglie says that it's not just quantities of light, it's quantities of electricity too. De Broglie says that electrons are quanta too. See this? Looks like diffraction, right? We did it with lasers. You can see local maxima, local minima. You can see, you can even see the shadow of here. There it is. There's the obstacle that's blocking the, well, I was going to say light. This is a beam from an electron gun. It's not light. It's electrons being shot at a photosensitive screen. Those are electrons diffracting around the obstacle. Electrons diffract. That means they have frequency. And if they have frequency, that means they have wavelength. De Broglie worked out the theory in 1926. I present it to you now because it was confirmed in the lab with this experiment two years later. Electrons have frequency and wavelength. They are as much waves as they are particles. Bet they didn't teach you that in middle school science. No. Nope. Um... They didn't teach that at the University of Paris either. The University of Paris refused to award de Broglie his PhD. Electrons have wavelength, those little particles that go around the nucleus and circuits. Man, are you insane? They left him, his committee la laughed him out of the room. They wouldn't take it seriously. They, they said it was absolute balderdash. However, in deference to the fact that he'd spent a lot of time and a bucket load of math on this, somebody took a copy and sent it to Berlin to one professor, Albert Einstein, saying, hey, professor, one of our graduate students just submitted this schmatte for his doctoral dissertation. I mean, is he nuts or what? Is, is, is there actually a possibility that any of this could be true? And Einstein says, yes! This is it! This is what we've been waiting for since 1903! <laughs> oh, this explains everything! This is brilliant! Give him his PhD and a ticket to Berlin! We have much to discuss. <laughs> de Broglie is coming to get back to him and say, I'm sorry about that, Dr. De Broglie. Just you know, a few bugs in the system. Here is your PhD. Boy, have you defended it. Also, Albert Einstein defended it on your behalf. Here, let's, let's see about getting you one of those little velvet berets and a hood with stripes and things. Here is what de Broglie said. Electrons are quanta too. They have wavelength. Yes, their matter waves get over it. And that, he says, is the answer to Bohr's question. Why are these things coming in integer numbers? Well, waves come in integer numbers. You can have one wave, crest, trough, done. You can have two waves, crest, trough, done. Take a rubber band from the kitchen drawer and draw a wave all the way around it. Think about those standing waves you made uh, on the day when your major assignment was take a wave generator and play with it. All the way around, crest, trough, and back again. It'll look a little bit like you're trying to draw a Mobius strip, but you will find that you will need a full integer number of wavelengths. There's no such thing as a standing wave made out of a wave and a corner. It goes up, down, up, 
down. And now that it has, goes down, the next step is going to be up again. And that's why the electron is only found at certain locations and not in others. Those locations correspond to a number of wavelengths. Take one wave, wrap it around in a circle so its tail comes back to its head, that's n equals 1. Take two waves, crest, trough, crest, trough, again, wrap it around to make a circle so the wave can fit in there. That is where the electron fits, wavelength by de Broglie wavelength. Now, matter waves mean that we can apply the equals hf to electrons, to matter, just as much as we did to photons. And this means that we can redefine momentum without using mass. <laughs> Remember the question from the first semester final, everybody learned the hard way, that um, choice D, I'm sorry everything we've learned this semester has no meaning, it's absolute gibberish, is definitely not the one the teacher was hoping you would pick. Momentum does have meaning. It means how hard something is to stop. Would you say an electron is easy or difficult to stop? Difficult. Okay. Even though it has a teeny, 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 tiny mass? Yeah. Yeah, nobody sends somebody out into the middle of Crawford and says, hey there, stop that electron. It may work with traffic if you have the appropriate uniform, but electrons are really hard to stop. And photons are really hard to stop either, even though they have no mass whatsoever. We need a formula for quantum momentum, one where the little m is not a factor. Well, we have e equals hf, and we have v equals lambda f, solve for f and substitute, and we'll get p, quantum momentum, is inversely proportional to wavelength, Long wavelengths are infrequent. They have lower momentum. Very, very short wavelengths are very, 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 very frequent. And they have very, very high momentum. Here is our energy. Here is our momentum. No mass whatsoever. Electrons, photons, and other quanta can have momentum and have kinetic energy without having any mass. They're completely unaffected by those classical MVs and one half MV squareds that Newton worked out, starting with what was in 16. 50-something, a very, very reasonable assumption that he was working with something he could hold and touch. Now, things are happening fast now. This is the golden age of the development of quantum mechanics. We have new theories and new experiments confirming them coming almost every year. Uh, Wolfgang Pauli, uh, also working out of Germany, uh, develops the Pauli Explosion Principle. And he describes everything he knows about atomic chemistry and physics by saying that no two electrons can share the same set of quantum numbers. They just can't. And this is how he describes the law of matter permanence, the fact that you can't put something where something else is. We've found in our day and age that this law um, is, uh, the key word here is matter. That is, it doesn't apply to dark matter, which we can't touch and is all around us, only we can't feel it, and we can be where it is no problem at all. But what makes electrons different? Well, technically, nothing. They're identical. Well, says Pauli, the electrons are identical, but their quantum numbers are not identical. First of all, if they're in different atoms, you're good to go. You know which electron is which based on what atom they're in. Well, this is the obvious question. What if they're in the same atom? Well, if they're in different orbitals, they have different energy levels, and that's a different quantum number. Well, what if you're not like hydrogen, and you have more than one electron in the same orbital? Well, says Pauli, then uh, they have different momentum. Well, what if they have the same momentum? Well, they have different angular momentum. For instance, um, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, we're out of ways to rearrange energy and momentum. Look, we got two here, two here, that makes four. The minute we get to boron, when we're opening up there um, with the same line with carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, you've got the p orbitals. You can have angular momentum around this axis, that's x, around this axis, that's y, and around this axis, that's z, two, four, six. So you are seeing the march of the periodic table here, where it goes two, four, six, all the way up to 10. And 
Here's Bohr's observation that electrons seem to come in even numbers. Electrons certainly do not travel in pairs. Electrons are negatively charged. They repel each other. But the last quantum number is spin. And there are exactly two possibilities for spin. One is clockwise and one is counterclockwise. You can model it as if if they're spinning in opposite di directions, they can keep out of each other's way. That's why the minimum number of electrons in any given orbital, in any given energy level, is two. One clockwise, one counterclockwise. And after that, it's going to have the same quantum numbers, starting with spin, as at least one other electron. And it's going to get booted out into another orbital. So in each orbital, in each lobe of the orbital, in each orientation, you can fit one clockwise, one clock counterclockwise, and then you are done. Bonk! That's why there are always two electrons in each full section of each orbital. It's at this point in 1928 that the theoretical physicists and the experimental physicists begin to go their separate ways, um, making two well-matched sets of jets and sharks um, to play each other in the annual laboratory basketball game. Heisenberg joins Pauli and Paul Dirac in the team of theoretical physicists. And Heisenberg says, look, if you're saying that all matter is made of waves, then you're going to have to face the fact that there are some wave behaviors um, that you have not hitherto accounted for, and you're not going anywhere until you account for them, and you adjust your expectations of what you're likely to see. Heisenberg says, look, there are basically two kinds of waves. There's a pulse wave, which goes and goes down there slinky. And there's a periodic wave, the kind of waves you get in math class, where somebody um, is shaking the slinky or the necktie or the necklace or the dog leash at a certain frequency so you can graph it with sine and cosine waves. Let's take a look. Here's a pulse wave over here, left side of my screen. This mirror thing is wonky. Okay, left side of the screen. Question one. Davida, yes. where is that wave? Shortest possible answer. You may use your fingers if it helps. There. Over there. Beautiful. <laughs> Done. Truer words never spoken. If you can answer the question, where is it, with over there, you are good to go. Second, what is its frequency? This black wave over here. How many black waves pass by your moving point one. per second? Really? One every second? Oh, no. Uh, it, when is it coming back? It's not. Uh, ugh. It you, is, you can't say that it has a frequency of zero it, because a frequency of zero means it's never coming, and this one is coming. It's coming, it goes by once, but then, but, but then there is. Yes, there isn't one in the next sentence. It doesn't have a frequency. It's a single wave, there isn't a frequency? Yeah, there, never mind. Never mind. There's no answer. There isn't even a question. The question doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's nonsensical. Heisenberg says, get used to it, boys and girls. This is wave behavior. Heisenberg says, okay, let's try it again. Let's start with the frequency. This is a periodic wave. Find the frequency of how many crests per second. Um, if you've got a clock or a watch, time this yourself. How many crests move per second? Or uh, better still, how many crests move by in 10 seconds? Take it away. Count those crests. Wait, I lost track. Shit. I got 10. So if there are 10 waves in 10 seconds, how many waves approximately are passing by each second? Beautiful. Now, the blue wave. Note singular. Where is it? Which one? Aha! And even if I told you which one, which I can't because there are an infinite number you, of them and they're all identical. You wouldn't be able to know because they're always moving. Yes! Oh so my you, gosh! you know where it was or you know where it's going to be but you don't know where it is at the moment. Okay. Where is it? Frankly, everywhere. Because, Somewhere over there. Yeah. If you hang out there long enough, a blue wave will come by at a if rate hang, of one per second. If you hang out there for one second or longer, there will be at least one blue wave going by. Heisenberg says, look, you can't have it both ways. One of these two questions is going to have an answer, and it's going to be a great answer, and it's going to make perfect sense with all the math. The other one, is going to be simply nonsensical. You either get where it is or what its frequency is. You can't get both. You can't get both. 
again, it's not only that there isn't an answer, it's that there isn't even a question. Heisenberg says, look, the best you can hope for if you're dealing with waves is going to start with the word probably. Heisenberg puts it into math and says, look, E equals HF, P equals HC over lambda. You cannot measure both position, that's where is it, and momentum, which is directly proportional to frequency, just like energy is, for the same quantum. You can either locate it, yeah, locate it for this moment, notice it's not going to be there a few seconds from now, or know where it's going, where is it now? No clue, but you definitely know where it's going, but never both. In the old days of the school, Mr. Scher was our Heisenberg uncertainty principle. He was our delocalized quantum on legs. If you have a form for the academic dean to sign, you can know where he is right now. Right now, he's standing outside the Spanish classroom talking loudly to one of our alumni and pounding Preston Schiller on the back. Yeah, two seconds from now, I guarantee, run, run with that purple form. He's not going to be there anymore. You can know where he's going. Probably he's going down to the main office for an administrative meeting. So hang out in the main office long enough. If you're lucky, he'll be there before the bell rings. Where is he now on his way to the office? Probably he stopped to talk to somebody else with a form for him to sign. Mr. Share, can I do an independent study in basket weaving? I promise I'll keep up with my work. But you're never going to know where he is and where he's going long enough to actually find him and get him to sign the form before the bell rings. Probably, well, probably he's in his office. I mean, it's, he's more likely in his office than anywhere else. Yeah, try that with Mr. Loeb. Mr. Loeb is in his office. You have an absolutely urgent problem and you need him now. Yeah, go on downstairs, see how well that works. Bet <laughs> he's in an admin meeting. Well, we can, we can make it slightly bigger. Probably he's somewhere in between his office on one end and the conference room at the back of the main office on the other end. Probably there's more than 50% chance he's somewhere in that space. Probably you want, you want to really hedge your bets. Probably he's somewhere in this school. You're almost 100% positive it's during the workday. He's probably somewhere in the building. Yes, yes, he might be out at some sort of federation event representing the school to the great and good. Um, might have made a Starbucks run in the hopes of busting the high knees of half a dozen students who are doing the same thing during the school day, despite the fact that we have closed campus. But he is almost certainly in the building. Heisenberg says, get used to it. Your description of where the electron is is never going to be more specific than that. And this answers Bohr's question as to why he thought those orbits were circles. And at the same breath asks, well, why circles? What's so special about circles? The answer is they're not. But the Bohr radii that Bohr calculated so accurately 15 years earlier are the most probable location for the electrons in that orbital. Honestly, they're probably not there, but if you want to find that electron, stake out at the Bohr radius and watch, and you're likelier to find the electron there than anywhere else. Now, let's put it all together. Hydrogen, 1s1. Where's the electron? Well, the electron is negatively charged. In the middle is a giant proton. The proton's positively charged. Where would you think the electron would probably be? Somewhere at the proton. That's it! And in the 1930s, they've hired these poor graduate students graphing by hand each of a bazillion points running through Heisenberg and Dirac and Pauli's probability equations and color coding how probable is this location. <laughs> now we have computer graphics and we can do it much, much Those faster. Poor graduate students. Well, the graduate students have color coded bright colors for high probability and dark colors for low probability. So looks like you're more likely to find the electron closer to the nucleus. Okay, n is 1. Um, we've got one state for angular momentum, one state for linear momentum, spin up, spin down. We've got room for 2 in here, and 1s1 is done. Hydrogen, helium. 
Next up, we have a third electron. That electron is booted out of this energy level, and we are here in 2s2. 2s2 is bigger. We need room for three electrons. There are two laws governing here. One of them is the first one. Where would you find any one or any two of the three electrons? Same Close, as before. Closest to the proton. Where is the one place that the third electron will not be? There. Where? Be very specific. Closest to... Oh, it wants to be closer to the proton, too. It's got plenty of negative charge to go around. But it'll get booted out by the other two because of... Ah, so it's, so it's not the proton. Specifically, the third electron will not be 100% guarantee. It will not be where the other two are. So if you're trying to avoid Mr. Loeb because you know your Spanish teacher sent him that email and you're going to be in for a world of trouble when he finds you, where should you not be? By his office. Yes. By the main office if you're conference room. Yes. If you're trying to avoid the unfortunate little meeting um, with the man in the neatly pressed uh, blue shirt uh, and the fabulous, he should be opening a shoe store with Rabbi Silver's shoes, you should not be hanging around right in front of his office. Do you see that third electron is not hanging around the first floor radius? The place where the other two electrons are likely to be, that third electron is not going to be there. It nope. does not want to no, run in you. with those other two. Now, the next obvious question, which are the first two electrons and which is the last one? The answer is it doesn't matter. It's not like they're in there in chronological order or something. All three electrons... Electron one, electron two, what? no. No, nope. no. All three electrons no, are trying to be close to the proton. And in even given time, one of them, zip, could be out here. And zip. Now another one could be out here. It's not that they don't go through this ring. It's that you're never going to catch them doing it. Now we've got room for two more here. Spin clockwise, spin counterclockwise. We have, as we said, lithium, beryllium, and now we're opening up the first p orbital. The p orbital looks like a figure eight. By the time we've got four other electrons in there that we need to stay away from, they're becoming a lot harder to avoid. As we said, we get one in the x direction, one in the y direction, one in the z direction. We have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon. We can run through it again. 3s2, 3p6. Now that we've got to 19, now that we get to potassium and calcium, yes, we have the 1s, we have the 2s, we have the 3s. Um, what do you expect to come after the 3s? Yeah, there'll be a 4s. In the 3s, where don't you find the extra electrons? In the 1s or the 2s. Okay, you don't find them at the first bore radius, you don't find them at the second bore radius, but you know, pretty much if you've, you've got, if you've got radius. more than 10 of them already, they're not going to be that close to the proton. You can see we're starting to get these weird hybrid p orbitals. You can sort of still see the figure 8 geometry there, but now we're opening up the d orbital. 21, we are at 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, d1. Specifically, um, it's 4d1. And d orbitals, I can't describe and I can't draw. I've seen them trying to be modeled in styrofoam. It's like a set of four figure eights superimposed over each other and not at cardinal wow. angles either. Well, the graduate students grafted and the computers bore them out 40 years later, so I'm not going to argue with their results. They're insanely complicated. And that's why here in the d orbitals, we get the effects we talked about earlier in the semester that we called electricity and magnetism. We said that right here, element 26, iron, the crystal repulsion pressure in a half full d orbital means that the electrons can spin together if there's a good reason for them to do so, and that gives rise to magnetism as we know it. Notice all oh. magnetic materials are right here on the periodic table. You can go as far as nickel, but once you're here to aluminum, the magnets don't stick to them. It's simply, it's not susceptible to magnetism. Now, put a few more electrons in there. You have a mostly um, full d orbital. We get copper, silver, 
and gold, you get electrical conductivity. You have enough electrons there to get a really good party, but not so many electrons that somebody says, pipe down, I'm trying to sleep, viz 12 people in one room on the Israel trip, and not so few electrons, one person in the room all by themselves, party in the USA. Oh, wait. What, you, isn't that graduation this year, though? There we go. <laughs> so we've got magnetism and electricity in those d orbitals, even more so when we can um, start opening up f orbitals. And this is why the um, Bohr model picture has stuck for over 100 years, because if you get the real atom, the quantum atom, you need a lot of ombre ingredients, and it is past magnesium and argon and calcium, virtually impossible to draw. All right, says Heisenberg, congratulations. You've just discovered that you can't draw the atom at all without a computer or a small army of graduate students. It gets better. If everything we're measuring comes with the word probably stuck in, for, in front of it, then we're going to have to deal with the mathematics of probability. And everything you ever learned in Algebra 1 and Pre-Calc about basic probability and compound probability is going to become really important really fast. Look, if you observe it, it's no longer probable. It either happened or it didn't. I'm recording this from home in the days of COVID-19. Well, everybody's saying, well, we probably won't have a vaccine within the next six months. We probably will open up the country anyway. We probably will have a repeat of history, like when they opened up the country in 1918, um, and the deaths wave. in the second wave were more deaths than everybody lost in World War I, and they still didn't get it. Well, how about we wash our hands, we wear our masks, we don't go out when we're sick, and we stay home unless we have major economic reasons for doing otherwise. And six months from now, it won't be we probably will or probably won't have found a vaccine. Six months from now, it will be fall, and either we will, 100%, or we won't, 0%. For instance, when I was teaching Algebra 1 and basic probability, I put on my worksheet, what's the probability that the White Sox would win the World Series? And I gave people sports stats and they figured it out. Then I asked the same question again in 2005, and it was the same answer. They worked through the same sports tests. I liked that class. Then came 2006. What is the probability that the White Sox would win the World Series? Answer? 100%. 100%. Many they won the World Series. Many embarrassing sports forfeitures were um, performed during morning announcements in Tefila. Um, many Cubs fans were put to shame by um, the people with whom they made bets. Um, and I had to update the question, and there had to be a follow-up question. What is the probability that the Cubs win the World Series? And back in the 2000s, Remember those days? The probability was 0%, or epsilon, if you speak math nerd, or when pigs fly, if you are of a literary Wait, dispensation. Wait, you have flying pig in your classroom? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and we do, have, we do have the flying pig in the classroom. So um, 2016, we can say when pigs fly and then take out the flying pig. Absolutely. <laughs> and 2016, um, we had to make allowances very quickly for a new senior ditch day in honor of the victory parade for the Cubs having won the World Series. Um, and many of our students and teachers in Lakeview um, were uh, calling on their phones or had live streaming on Facebook the fact that their windows were open. And although they did not live across the street from Wrigley Field, just having the open windows, you um, could hear the city singing, go Cubs, go, go Cubs, go, from one end of Lakeview and Lincoln Park to the other. Probability, 100%. Probability for this season, 2020, 0%. zero percent. <laughs> Doesn't let's, matter what team, zero percent. Let's thing. get that vaccine. <laughs> this is the mathematics of probability. Observation interferes with the system. We're not used to having observation interfere with the system in the laboratory. 
Mathematicians call this the Monty Hall problem after a famous game show host. And they say, all right, you're a contestant on a game show. There are three doors. One of them has a brand new car behind it. The other two have goats. You choose a door, that one. Monty Hall says, interestingly enough, you chose door number three. I am now going to open door number one and show you that behind door number one is a goat. It is a very sweet goat. And perhaps um, if you're a hippie granola sustainable person like your physics teacher, you might say, well, let's look at the economic benefits of owning a goat as opposed to owning, say, a lawnmower. Both of them do the same thing. They keep the grass in the yard you get nice and short. For goats. goats are better. Oh, interesting. All right. We don't need the nuclear power plant in Zion. We don't need petroleum politics. I'm saying that's it. That goat looks pretty. Okay, who am I kidding? I'd rather have the car. All right. So. If it's a comparison to a lawnmower, I don't 100% choose the goat. They're cute. <laughs> All right. Do you, the mathematicians ask, stick with door number three or you switch to door number two? Now, as I mentioned, we chose our teams in 1928. I am fully on team experimental physics. I am an experimentalist. I was trained by experimentalist. Um, and I can always tell a good theoretical physicist in the making when they come to me with a homework question. I say, that's very interesting. Here, shove a lot of equipment all across the desk. Try it and see. If they turn red in the face and start stuttering and shouting, I know I found a theoretical physicist. Oh, they hate being told, just try it and see. They want to know why. I'm good with just try it and see. And again, in the 2000s when I taught um, Algebra 2, Trig, and Pre-Calc, I said, okay, everybody pair up. One person be the game show host, draw three doors. Game show hosts don't give the game away. Start playing and go. And we measured and we got experimentally the same results that the math problem gives. And yes, we did flip coins. We did not use random number generators. I don't trust those things. Never trust anything that can think for itself. If you can't, you can't see, see where, where it keeps, keeps its, its brain. brain, even if it's only generating random numbers. If I can't see the code with my own eyes, there's probably a pattern in there somewhere. Wait, but so you don't trust the website Charlie and I used when we were trying to do the dice thing? Of course I do. I, could, I, um, I have access um, to the code for that. That's okay. publicly available code. Yes, okay. Um, so the ex in experimentation we found that instead of a one-third, one-third, one-third chance where each door has an equal chance and there's absolutely no benefit to second-guessing yourself in the end, who I'm going to pay for this on the next test, in the Monty Hall problem, there actually is a measurable benefit to second-guessing yourself if the host opens a door and says, are you sure you still want to pick door number three? The probability is strongly in your favor that if you switch to door number two, it will probably be the car. That's insane. Equal probabilities, door number one, door number two, door number three. How could anything deflect this one third, one third, one third? Okay, now we're down one door. What ought to be the probability of the car being behind either door. There are only two doors. It should be 50-50. It should be 50-50. How can that change? The answer is, in order to play the game correctly, the student who's playing the part of the game show host has to know inside information. Mentally, or actually on the stage, that host has to be able to observe behind which door the car is. Let's say the car is behind door number two and you pick door number three. Which door isn't the game show host going to open if she knows the car's behind door number two? She, uh, he or she wouldn't obviously not open door number two, but Aha. there would, you know, be Okay, that and that's car. what breaks down the 50-50. You may choose randomly, but the host is not choosing randomly. The host is choosing a door based on inside information. And if the car is behind door number two, there's a 100% chance that the host will open door number one if you pick door number three. Look to see if the host falters <laughs> when picking between doors. Okay, these people are professionals. <laughs> um, but again, we wrote out the sample space. It was wearisomely large. And the fact that the host had inside information justified those results in the Monty Hall problem saying, actually, this is the one case where it is beneficial to have a terrible attack of second guessing and go and change all your answers. Guys, 
This does not work on physics tests. If you're not actually answering the Monty Hall question, don't second guess yourself. Go with your first instinct unless you can actually find a missing squared or a lost negative in the formula or realize that you ignored all the units and forgot your metric conversions. Once you observe the system, you reduce the Heisenberg uncertainty. The wave function collapses into one known state. The electron either is there or it isn't. If you keep observing the system, your act of observation will create an end state. Regular computing will never be able to keep up with quantum computing, either in speed or in security, because regular computer code in computer language is written with ones and zeros. Um, it's been written that way since the 19th century. One is on, zero is off. If you're expecting data streaming in a certain frequency, you could check every microsecond or nanosecond or whatever it is, on or off. You can record the ones and zeros and translate that based on the language that you're using, or as you call it for hardware that you're plugging into your um, computer, the drivers. Quantum computers, however, are not limited to sending data in ones and zeros. Quantum computers send data in quanta, and a quantum can be both a one and a zero at the same time, as long as nobody is observing it. The data is sent from one quantum computer. The wave function travels to the receiving quantum computer and is decoded using a key. And oh boy, does that key has to be specific. Not only does it have the numerical key, but these quanta are as much waves as their particles. That means they are polarized. And the person with the key has to know whether it's a vertical polarization filter or a horizontal polarization filter. So let's start with the fact that if the hacker gets it wrong, the first thing the hacker is going to do is choose the wrong polarization filter, squishing all the data flat as a bug. So the hacker will get nothing for all his or her pains. Second, even if the hacker guesses the polarization right, the fact that the hacker has observed the quantum means that it's not sending four Same times data. as much data as any regular computer. Zero and one at the same time, doubling on two separate axes, horizontal polarization and vertical polarization. Uh, oh, by the way, it's perfectly possible to cross your filters like this and have diagonal polarization if you really want to give the hackers a hard time. Go diagonal. Absolutely. But the minute that hacker observes it, it ceases being the quantum stream where each electron, each photon, can physically be 50% of a 1 and 50% of a 0. So Schrodinger's cat, basically. That's where Schrodinger's cat is getting it. Schrodinger um, was working on this with Heisenberg, and Schrodinger says this is nonsensical in the macroscopic universe. Schrodinger says, you can tell me that you have an electron that's 50% here and 50% there. All right, I've seen it on a screen, one electron. But he says, try to translate it to an atom, you have one atom of radioactive uranium. There's a 50% chance that it's decayed, a 50% chance that it's not decayed. Well, if you wait long enough, it will be decayed. Well, he says you wait a certain amount of time and then you look, and I guarantee you that it will be decayed or it won't be decayed. Now, says uh, Schrodinger, I am willing to accept that, but only because I don't actually care about the state of one uranium atom. One atom never made any difference to anybody unless it was starting the chain reaction in a nuclear bomb, and even then it's going to take more than one. So Schrodinger says, you want to say, oh, it scales up so beautifully from one electron to one atom and one atom to many and many to all of nature. Yeah, he says, let's put a Geiger counter in the box, okay? And if the atom is still radioactive, if it has not decayed, then the Geiger counter will beep. And if it has decayed and it's not radioactive anymore, the Geiger counter will not beep. Let's set the Geiger counter for what? One hour, two hours? Let's give it some time. And let's put in the box um, a vial of something nasty and poisonous 
and a hammer with a clapper on it. So if something beeps, it'll activate the clapper, the hammer will smash the flask, and the box will be filled with something noxious. And if nothing beeps, everything will be fine. Then, says Schrodinger, if, if you haven't gotten it yet, that this Let's is a, a monstrous there. joke, that this is beyond ridiculous, that this is past believable for any human being, um, let's take that neighbor's miserable cat um, that kills birds and your child's pet hamster um, and, you know, whittles on old ladies and is the meanest, nastiest um, streak of evil ever on this block. Um, let's go like Angel and Rent and do an emergency decatification of the block here um, and put... Dog. Well, same idea. same idea. I believe in the original Labo M it was a parrot who wouldn't shut up. Um, let's put the cat in the box and close the box and walk away. Now, says Schrodinger, you can say that the electron is 50% in this state and 50% in that state. You can say that the atom is 50% decayed and 50% undecayed. But if you tell me that for those two hours, the cat is 50% dead and 50% alive, then I dare you to open the box, says Schrodinger. And Curiosity kill the cat. Well, you'll discover that there's, there's a third state for Schrodinger's cat, dead, alive, and bloody furious. Right? <laughs> Don't tell me, says Schrodinger, that a macroscopic object can be 50% alive and 50% dead. You didn't kill the cat. <laughs> Don't, th this is nonsense, says Schrodinger, and Schrodinger says, until you can explain what's wrong with this picture, you have no business puddling around in quantum mechanics. Now, the solution to the problem um, is one of very, very patiently applied mathematics. The reason it's nonsensical um, is because Schrodinger's cat is composed of so many more atoms than Avogadro could possibly have counted um, with single and double digit number of electrons per atom. And you can say that one electron can be in this state, but getting them all to do it together is going to be as hard as, you'll pardon me, hurting cats. And by the time you get to the macroscopic, it is very, very, very clear where the matter is and where it isn't, because everything has to be working together. And that is the only possible way. And that's how we can operate with absolute certainty. Because if you look at all those other possibilities, you'll find that one of them is going to be incompatible with one of the quantum numbers of the Google's worth of Googleplexes of electrons in there. So that at this point, very few people remember the joke in Schrodinger's cat and are using it as a philosophy as a paradigm of philosophy for other things, up to and including the current situation. Welcome to the USA, because we cannot be tested. We can't know whether we have the virus or not. We have to assume we do have the virus so that we don't spread it to other people. However, we have to assume that we don't have the virus because we don't have immunity. Schrodinger's virus, COVID-19, you simultaneously do have it and you don't have it. Probability, 50-50. Stay safe, everyone.